Hi, everyone. Welcome to a continuation of our WTF, What's the Future with Embrace series. Today's discussion is an introduction to our Embrace Intelligent Force Systems, what we call IFS. As we take this behind the scenes for you following your approved smile designs, we want you to feel confident in the why behind it all. So we're diving into it today. Leading this discussion, we have Dr. Robert Lee and an Embrace veteran, but a new face to this series, Dr. Douglas Hom. Dr. Douglas Hom did his dental and ortho training at UCSF and USC. He worked in private practice in Southern California for over 30 years, and he's been with Embrace for over seven years, leading our clinical smile design team. So again, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight, especially after a long day of work, um, and for your continued support through this series. Again, we have two sessions for this series, like we always do. One today that you're tuning in and attending right now, and another one on Thursday, November 16th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern, in case you want to cover the material again. And as always, feel free to use the chat feature to ask any questions. We'll have the Q&A at the end, and I'll be oversight of all the messages coming in. Um, with that, Bobby, go ahead and flip it. We have a reminder of our clinical education materials available for you. Additionally, the WTF webinars that you've been a part of thus far and the one we're having today are recorded and will be posted on our YouTube, um, along with our Gen 2 mini residency is on learning dot. So don't forget to go ahead and take a peek at that. If you have any questions, please let us know. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Hom to kick it off on Embrace Smile Design Process. Well, good evening to everybody. I'm so excited to be here. As, as uh, Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Tara. So I have been, even though I've been with the company a long time, I've been very much behind the scenes. So it's fun to kind of step out and, and meet you all. So the focus of today's webinar is, as Dr. Tara said, Embrace's new intelligent force system. It's a new process that's gonna make your time spent with smile design, not only more productive, but much more efficient. So in my mind, along with the Gen 2 appliance, the intelligent force system is super significant step in the development of Embrace. And it's a very important thing. So I'm glad that you're all here to learn about it. Dr. Lee will be presenting on that very shortly. But before jumping into IFS, we're gonna spend just a few minutes reviewing the basic Embrace smile design process and how that ties into the new intelligent force system. So this is a flow chart that shows the basic Embrace smile design overview. Um, the top row is those are involved with digital orthodontics, nothing new. Same as the second row. Everybody's very familiar with uh, this process. The third row is where our new intelligent force system is applied. And again, Dr. Lee is going to be talking about that uh, shortly. The three red boxes are where doctors are involved, where you're involved. The purple or blue boxes are kind of behind the scenes, and we're going to chat about it. It's where Embrace is involved. So we'll take a little look uh, behind the curtain. This is just a basic uh, case submission records, and it shows us what the tooth print, extra and intraoral photos, and a panoramic radiograph. So pretty standard, nothing new with that. And it, as simple as it sounds, when you submit this, please be sure that all those are matching. Um, again, it sounds simple, but we, we do get cases where the photos and the scan or photo and, and x-ray are for different patients. So if that happens, unfortunately, it slows the process down for you because you'll be getting a call from someone from Embrace clarifying which one's the real patient. Is it the photo? Is it correct? Or is it the tooth prints correct or, or, or whatever? So please be sure those are, are matching. And again, as simple as it sounds, please be sure the images are, are clear. Uh, for instance, if you submit a tooth print and, and, and you want the case to be seven to seven, but the scan only picks up six to six, that, that's not going to work, and you'll be getting a, a contact from someone from Embrace again. Or if the photos are super blurry, and they're not really all that, that helpful. So very basic things, but very simple. What we're showing here, uh, I think, is a trend in orthodontics, digital orthodontics. A number of docs are submitting these images from the scan rather than true photographs. 
So I understand that saves time and seems easier, but the reality is uh, we don't recommend that. The reason being, if you think about it, there's no additional information. Those are essentially colorized uh, scans. So there's no additional information as you would get with a, a photograph. Um, now this is not legal advice, but you know I was thinking about this. And if you don't have photos, that's a little bit scary to me because that's the only record you have of what the patient looked like pre-treatment. And unfortunately, if there's a post-treatment dispute, if you don't have photos, you don't have any uh, proof of, of what happened. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I took my car for some basic service at a dealer, very large dealer here in Ally. And as they were doing the intake process, I noticed they started taking photos of the whole outside of my car. They hadn't done that before, but very detailed photos. And I thought, you know what? I, I bet they get complaints now and then people got that ding, that ding wasn't there. You guys did it. You know, no, you need to fix it for me. So the point being uh, is if it's good enough for our cars and certainly should be important for our patients too. This is a simple example of a frontal smiling photo. And as you can see, without a photo, there's no information for us in terms of uh, how the occlusal plane is oriented, or if there's any cats that might be there. So the small design team actually uh, orients the model towards a photo. But if there isn't a photo and only those uh, colorized scans, then they're not able to do that. So very helpful to have a smiling photo like that. This is another example of a frontal smiling photo. And as you can see, you can look at the smile and seeing how that relates to the lower lip, as well as the gingival margin, how it relates to the upper lip. So what's the point of that? I mean, some doctors and their treatment plans are real specific and say, intrude the uppers so much, intrude the lowers or extrude the uppers, vice versa. But if the doctor doesn't give any specific information about extrusion, intrusion, the tech doesn't have anywhere to go with it. At least with a photo, they can look at that and, and make some type of judgment whether it'd be better to extrude or intrude one or the other, or perhaps both. So another example of how a smiling photo can help the technician. This is an example of a case submission form where if you look at the bottom, super specific, instructions are given and it says correct a class one and they say upper left six is a crown it was too large on the mesial and they're going the dentists will reduce that move upper left four mesially and open space for the upper left five they're going to do an implant later and they're requesting a, a specialty wire to help with that space opening and they want us to match upper midline to lower and they want a reverse curve of speed on the bottom. So one millimeter overbite is okay. So you can see those are super specific instructions. So the tech has something to work with as opposed to uh, a treatment plan where nothing is written. Now this is an example of just the opposite where the submission just chose to leave the defaults. And it says very, very little in here other than that they want brackets upper seven to seven, lower six to six. But other than that, compared to the previous treatment plan, very little is, is given. So if you submit a treatment plan like this and the case is super simple, let's say, maybe just very, very minor rotations, but the bite, et cetera, is good. It'll probably work out okay. But if you submit a treatment plan form like that and there's significant issues, you're probably not gonna get the type of small design that you envision. This is another example of uh, a submission with neither photos nor real specific instructions. So these are just colorized scans. And, and then on the right, you see where they've just accepted the defaults with no information. So on the bottom here it says, for example, technician gets this and they might say, gosh, are we supposed to extrude the uppers or intrude the lowers or both? Kind of like we talked about a couple slides back. Or is the occlusal plane correctly positioned? Or in a case that has a crossbite, are we supposed to correct it or just leave it? 
those are just a few examples of things that the techs have to deal with. And without uh, specific instructions, it makes it very, very difficult. Okay, this is a case submission form for a digital enhancement. The previous ones were for initial exams, but the principle is really the same. Um, please be sure to let us know what the goals are. So when they do the small design setup, I can try to reach those goals for you. Another important point is looking at the treatment diagram here is really very simple. When you look at the legend, there's only four choices, X for teeth to be extracted, little bracket for teeth that you want brackets on, and then an outline for teeth that are either missing or previously extracted, and gray for teeth not to be moved. So really pretty simple to fill out. Um, but what's important is that it be filled out accurately. Because again, if, if this form is filled out and it does not match the information that is on the tooth print, you're gonna get contacted by someone from Inverse again, trying to clarify what the intent is. And that just slows everything down for you. So please be sure those diagrams are accurate and match what is in the tooth print. Now, looking on, let's go back to that one, Dr. Lee. Another important part of this is number 13. Now, some docs on their DEs are super specific and say, you know what, I wanna finish this case. I'm happy with everything except for the upper right two, let's say, and the you know upper left two. I just want slight rotation on those. And that is all they want. So if you look at number 13, there's a choice there that says, allow embrace to perform additional adjustments and that's theirs now. So that's your intent, that you only want those two, three, one, whatever it is, specific teeth moved. Please check that. Otherwise, if you check yes, other teeth may be moved as uh, the tech team's uh, necessary. Another important one is number 14, and that kind of gets to the goal of it. Um, this one here is checked, accept current occlusion, but improve on, on detailing. If you check that one, the text basically going to align, detail the anterior teeth, and leave the posterior as it is. Um, you'll see the second one there says settle the current occlusion, but improve on detailing. That one is a step up. They're going to detail the anterior teeth, but they'll also bring the posterior teeth together into some type of occlusion. The third one's a little bit tricky because they'll move the teeth to make it look like the initial or previously approved uh, setup. So there may be a lot of movement on the teeth. And um, the fourth one is the detailing and some changes in treatment goals, which would probably be spelled out under special instructions. So bottom line is on these DEs, please uh, lay out your goals so the technician knows what it is you're trying to achieve for the setup. Okay, here's another important point for the DEs. This also is a DE form, but notice in the red box, there's some specific instructions for AP correction. Here the doc says the right side, they wanna get it to class one, left side, current. And then number nine, they give uh, that they're gonna use a combination of TADs and class two elastics to achieve that. The reason that's important is uh, the technician doesn't know, like you could have the initial treatment plan where it was a full correction of the class two, and it comes back and maybe nothing's corrected yet. So the tech thinks, are they supposed to set it up like the initial with class two? Or, or maybe they're changing the goal. Maybe they're giving up on the class two correction. So on the DE, please uh, make it specific for AP, whether you want to leave it as it is or whether you want to uh, achieve something. Okay, this one's a little bit uh, separate from what we've been talking about. But a point is that most intraoral scanners are not very good at picking up real small spaces. And if you can see between the, uh, I guess it would be upper left one and two, there's a little bridge between the teeth where there's a space in there. So the point being is if there's a space that you wanna deal with for sure that you wanna close, it helps if you write it in the treatment plan form. Because what happens is uh, the technician can then adjust the tooth print to reflect that there really is a space there. If you don't have any notes, they're gonna assume that, that that's not a space. So a, a little small uh, trick there with spaces. Okay, 
Oh, you can go back to the previous one. This is just the second round. Again, I think digital orthodontists are very familiar with this whole thing. But once the small design is created, it's forwarded to the doctor to do one of two things. They can either approve it, then it goes into appliance production, or they can ask for revisions. Um, something I want to bring up is happens where doctors have real specific clinical questions or technical questions that frankly are beyond the scope of what the technician can answer. So let's say if you have a question like that, you're better off going one of two other routes, contact your TIS. And for most basic questions, how this rubber band should fit or I'm hooking it onto whatever, they can answer those. If you have a more complex clinical question, then I'd recommend scheduling a clinical review with one of our internal orthodontists. So again, the technicians, uh, they're all very bright and great trained, but they're not trained to answer super specific orthodontic and clinical questions. Okay, these are just some examples of how to uh, make a request for a change in a, in a DE. So do use short, clear instructions. Try to avoid jargon or non-standard abbreviations. And three, use landmarks as description if possible. So it's kind of funny because this morning I, I reviewed a DE case that came in. And it's an example of jargon. The technician can make on what do you think they mean? And the doctor had written, for upper posteriors, dash, be sure the Q line follows a spiral pattern. So the technician asked me, what do you think that means? And uh, I have no idea. So that's an example, I think, of, of jargon. It was very meaningful to that doctor, regardless, you know, whatever training he's had or, or whatever they do in their office. But for the technician here, they're not going to know what a lot of that means. So I want to avoid, uh, avoid any uh, jargon or non-standard type uh, abbreviations. So these are some sample responses that are good. Notice how specific they are. Overcorrect to three millimeters overbite by extruding both upper and lower two to two, half millimeter past the idea, super specific. Tech will understand that and give you exactly what you want. Or IPR, specifically how much and where they want it, 0.3 between uh, lower four to four. Or expansion wise, expand upper four to seven, a couple millimeters past the ideal, and then adjust upper three to three accordingly. And the last one, given us a specific number of local root torque that they want on the upper sixes and sevens. So again, real specific instructions and something that the tech will uh, be able to follow very clearly. One last slide of, of examples. It, it helps to use some landmarks, like where it says extrude upper right one to be level with upper left one, upper right one, level with upper left one. That's a great way to put it because the tech knows what it is you're trying to achieve. Oftentimes we get something where the doc will say extrude upper right one, one millimeter. You know, and visually one millimeter is actually a lot. So if in the current occlusion, malocclusion, it's a little bit short, we extrude it one millimeter as the ass, it's gonna look really long. But without any comparison to make it level with say the upper left one, the tech is gonna do that. They're gonna extrude a millimeter and you'll get that back on gosh, where did they make this thing? You know, so I'd be a little bit careful with giving absolute numbers without uh, a comparison tooth. And then a couple of examples of root tip here, meso root tip, and specify that you want to keep the distal stable and extrude just the mesial. Similarly with the rotation, that you want to rotate mesial in, but keep the distal stable. So it's a really great way of uh, putting it so the tech can know exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. At some point, doc's going to be happy with what they have received, and they're going to approve that setup, and at which point it's going to go into, if they have opted for it, our intelligent force system. So I'm going to turn this over to the famous Dr. Lee, who's going to uh, enlighten us about IFS. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Cool. Thanks, Dr. Rob. Okay, so I'm going to go over now what is the Embraced Intelligent Force System. Uh, before I go into that, usually I would start with uh, most of what we know with um, in-brace treatment is orthodontics in general. 
is applicable, whether it's in brace, traditional braces, or aligners. Um, it's really just those final like 10% of nuances. I would say 90% of your orthodontic biomechanics and principles are going to be the same. Uh, I think the one that's very relevant to embrace IFS or intelligent force systems is how kind of aligners, uh, particularly Invisalign, have developed. Where Invisalign, you know, started with attachments and then they then later developed optimized attachments. They have what they call their smart force system, you know, smart staging. And so they did a lot of this to try to automate and simplify uh, to make it easy for a very busy practice and busy orthodontist to utilize aligners in a very predictable and efficient way uh, that saves time for everybody involved. So that's essentially kind of what our, our goals have been when we've been developing the Embrace Intelligent Force Systems. And so the Embrace Intelligent Force System or IFS is mainly gonna be focused around the small design. And so when we talk about the nuances of embrace treatment, usually I talk about model design, clinical approach, and clinical technique. You need to kind of have a good understanding of all three to be successful with embrace. And so with IFS, we're really trying to make the small design section very predictable and efficient for all providers. And so in the small design approach, usually I, I teach to create your patient-specific ideal setup, which is creating your predictable and, treat and achievable treatment goals. And then the one that we care about in this webinar is adding the overcorrection. And these overcorrections are critical to get a predictable and efficient result with your smart wires. And then you would do your clinical approach. So I think many of you have seen or watched some of the different content I've created. And usually I teach a systematic approach for approaching your small design setups, where you take a five-step approach where you look at vertical AP and transverse for standard orthodontic treatment planning. Look at how you're going to deal with your crowding and spacing, such so as your arch length discrepancy, and then just do a final check of any individual teeth. So do an assessment to make sure every individual tooth is where you want it after you've done vertical AP transverse and arch length discrepancy. And we then created uh, a reference guide. So these five steps are in the Embrace Mini Residency. It's in a module three, and I go through in every uh, pretty uh, good amount of detail on how to address each one of them. And then we created this reference guide, which has the five steps that breaks it down into, if you went step by step, this is how you do a small, uh, um, a small design. And, you know, the feedback I get quite often is we get that it's pretty straightforward. We get that it's standard, but it's still a lot for us to do. It's a lot for us to think about. So is there any way you can make this easier? And some of these things are very specific to embrace, you know, vertical AP transverse overcorrect is standard, you know, adding a reverse curve of CN, you know, adding some overcorrection to counteract counteract some elastics or to expand expand that's all pretty standard. That's what we often call it internally like general orthodontic overcorrections. But when you get into like the arch length discrepancy overcorrections and the individual tooth assessments, and we started like counting them out, where okay, we got our general orthodontic overcorrections. We add some overcorrections for arch length discrepancy, which is for opening space, or for adding root tip or tore for space closure, a gable bend or something of that nature. Uh, and then when you look at your individual tooth assessment, then you may be adding an overcorrection for increased root tip and uh, torque to counteract uh, the vertical side effect from torque, to counteract the upper central incisor rotation tip side effect, and then adding different types of virtual power chain to keep spaces closed. You know, we, we understand that this is a lot for someone to have to think about and a lot for, uh, and then for many of these things, uh, these overcorrections, you know, within the company of Embrace, we has studied this like no other. You know, we've studied thousands and thousands of cases. We know exactly how to do it. Um, and we would add a lot of these in for our providers, actually even pre, um, when we'd give it to you in the setup. And we'd get a lot of pushback actually, uh, when we'd add a lot of these overcorrections for people. Um, so what we did is we decided to work on what we call the Embrace Intelligent Force System. It's an overcorrection algorithm. Um, this was developed by a very large core team within our Embrace uh, internal team. We you know we worked with our R and D team, engineering team, software team, and the clinical team. We worked together really closely, and we worked together on this project for a while. And we did a lot of testing and data analysis from thousands and thousands of embrace cases. We have, you know, a vast library of patient submissions at this point. We have a lot of follow up data from all the digital enhancement submissions that we get from all the providers, as well as in our own internal embrace clinic, which we call in studio orthodontics. We actually take monthly scans for many of our patients, and we actually even bring some patients back weekly. Uh, that way we get a lot of data to know exactly what's happening throughout the process of ortho a treatment with Embrace. And through that, we finally were able to come up with this intelligent force system algorithm. And we've been testing it for a while. Uh, we've gone through a beta test and a pilot test um, through with many different providers as well. 
So far, feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. So we've now moved into our early access opt-in for our providers. With early access opt-in, which I think many of you have already potentially been opted in at this point, uh, you will get an announcement on your uh, portal, your Smile Design Studio, that looks like this to customize your Smile Design preferences. Uh, when you click Next, you will then get prompted to either accept the defaults that we've created for the Smile Design preferences, or you can edit the preferences and change any of these to your, your liking. Uh, it is recommended to do this. Dr. Hom's team does actually look at this before they do any Smile Designs. So then you just have to click Accept. Once you click Accept, then you're opted in. Uh, you can always opt out, um, so it's it's not a mandatory thing to be part of IFS. It, it is our recommendation to be part of IFS. You are taking the learnings that we've uh, that we have from you know all the data that we we have collected for it with Embrace. Uh, but you are totally allowed to opt out if you would prefer to add an overcorrection to yourself. There are some providers and some doctors that really want to have that control of their own. Uh, and if that's the case, you simply can just uncheck Intelligent Force Systems. It's the first. Uh, section of your small design preferences. And you're able to either uh, uncheck intelligent force systems or you can even uncheck the universal virtual power chain as well. So the way that it works is, as Dr. Han was mentioning, after you do doctor, after you approve the case is when we'll actually apply the IFS algorithm. So again, it's after doctor approval. Uh, and even after the algorithm is applied, we actually have our internal, because it's so early still, you know, we, we did go through beta and pilot testing, but we're still in our early access opt-in. We uh, are still making sure that the algorithm is applied perfectly on every, every patient. So we do have our internal clinical team of orthodontists. Many of you guys have met some of the ones that, that meet with clinical review, but we've all gone through a lot of extensive training to calibrate between um, ourselves. And so one of our internal clinical team members uh, who are all orthodontists will do a final check and adjust the algorithm as needed. Um, if you do have any overcorrections that you personally have already added or requested for, we will always respect that. So it's, it's another check to make sure that while we do have an algorithm that's being applied, we are always double checking and, and listening to whatever is requested by a provider. So if you ask for a specific amount of overcorrection, we will respect that uh, overcorrection. Uh, we won't change it to whatever our algorithm uh, recommends. Um, and then... So looking at the uh, overcorrections again, um, it's important to know what we IFS will do and then what you as the provider or the doctor is responsible for. So at the current moment, the general over orthodontic overcorrections, vertical AP transverse, IFS is not taking care of that. That is um, under the control of the provider. So if you need to do any overcorrection to the curve of speed, counteract side effects for elastics, you want to do expansion overcorrection, that's a buckle root torque to counteract the tipping. Uh, that is all under your responsibility. You, you need to request and add that into your setup. For the rest of them, uh, anything with arch discrepancy, individual tooth assessments, so step four and five in our five-step approach, that is all covered by IFS at this point. So again, vertical, provider is, is not covered by IFS. So this is our systematic approach, our recommendations, where you measure your initial overbite, you estimate the effective crowding spacing and IPR, you add in overcorrection to the overbite, whether you're gonna um, open it more or deepen it further past the ideal. So an example of that would be, you have an open bite tendency case, you're gonna deepen it. So here I would might ask overcorrect to three millimeters of overbite by extruding both upper and lower two to two by 0 0.5 millimeters past the ideal might even add some IPR. So that again is all the provider's responsibility to add in. We're not doing anything with that in regards to uh, with IFS. Same thing with AP. Um, the Any AP overcorrections, so you're running class two elastics, class three elastics, you want, you're concerned about any side effects from them. That is all again under the responsibility of the provider as, as you as the doctor uh, at the current moment. So, um, if you're running class three elastics, for example, usually we'll add distal crown tip. So whatever molar is, is the anchor for your elastics, usually we'll add about five degrees of distal crown tip. That's our recommendation, at least. Uh, reason why it's hard for us to add this in for IFS is we don't typically know where you're going to run the elastics or if you're going to even run elastic. You know, sometimes you might run a short class two or class three elastic from upper four to lower six or upper three to lower, upper, lower five. So, you know, things like that, it's hard for us to know that. So that's why it wasn't part of our first round of IFS to include this at the, at the moment. And then with transverse as well, um, this is provider responsibility. So 
if you wanted to try to achieve some dental expansion, you know, one to two millimeter per side is achievable. So you may ask for, you know, up to two, three millimeters of expansion per side. Usually we'll add some buccal root torque to the molars and premolars. Um, that is something that you would need to request for and add into your small design before you approve it. So in this case here, what I may request from the small designer, uh, I might expand upper and four to seven by three millimeters uh, past the ideal on both sides, adjusting the upper alignment accordingly, add some focal root torque to the upper six and seven, then to the fours and fives. So this would be requested, this would be added to the small design, and then I would approve it. Um, this would not be, again, be covered by IFS. So what is covered by IFS are the remaining seven overcorrections, starting with an arch length discrepancy. So with space opening and space closing, with space opening, typically we recommend overcorrecting past the ideal. And it's kind of like adding open coral springs. You, you kind of have to, it's better to have more space than that too little space. If you have enough space, then you can send to the dentist, they can do the buildups. You can close the remaining space with a digital enhancement smart water. So that's our general philosophy with Embrace and what we're doing when we're adding in uh, IFS to open space. We'd rather create more space than less space. So in a case like this, this was a case of provider asked for ideally what they wanted around the upper right two for a buildup. They didn't. Have, this is without IFS. This is without any overcorrection. And you see what generally will happen is it's unpredictable. You may get it open. We've seen cases where it works, but we've also seen cases where when you ask for just the ideal amount of space you want, it's not enough force to open up the space, and then you end up having to do a digital enhancement, and then you add the overcorrection. So what would be better is kind of in a case like this where we're doing buildups around the upper twos, this is where IFS has been added. We actually added about a half a millimeter past the ideal of what we ideally wanted for the buildups. It's very similar again to an open coral spring. With open coral spring, you always add, usually I tell my assistants, add about a bracket length activation. Uh, again, you're just trying to get it bigger and then you can always dial it back um, or you send for the dentist, you get the buildup and then you, then you close the space. So in this case, what ended up happening is the space open fairly predictably, especially because we had an excess force. In some spots, it didn't open again as much as it did in the small design, but it's opened up enough that I can now send to the dentist, do the buildup, and then they come back and they uh, close the remaining space with digital enhancement. Uh, with space closure, you know, space closure honestly can get kind of complicated with, with overcorrection. And that's why um, it was one of the reasons why we're like, okay, it might be good to bring this with I under IFS where you have to add, you know, potentially tip or torque. Uh, and then we're trying to create like acronyms and different ways to teach people, this is how much overcorrection you, you would do. And you would actually have to think about how much side effect am I gonna have? What is my initial angulation? Do a math problem and figure out, okay, this is how much overcorrection I need. And then it gets even further complicated by when you have more spaces, when you have generalized spacing, you have to even counter consider, okay, this is, the amount of space on this side, so that's deactivating the amount of tip, but I still have to add torque. So it sometimes becomes quite complicated, and then you have to even add in the rotation tip side effect. So, um, but you know, with our algorithm, we can calculate all of that pretty easily, and then we have a good understanding of how to combine all of that together. And so if you don't do IFS, say for a case like this, um, when you're close a space with ideal angulation uh, without over any overcorrection, it's gonna dump into the space. So in this case here, what happened is you can see the upper right one just dumped into the, the diastema. Uh, the tip isn't really that well controlled, but we know that if we add a gable bend, and we usually would actually do this for providers. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, we'd have providers take it out because they didn't like how it looked uh, in the small design. But we know that if we add this in, it adds the force to counteract, it adds an anti-tip force. Uh, to counteract the crown tipping into the space. And so the clinical outcome usually is fairly predictable uh, with space closure. We know uh, when we when you add in overcorrection. So from a provider perspective, if you've opted into IFS, it's very, very simple. Uh, for space opening and closing, just set whatever you want into ideal. Set it exactly what you want for the amount of spaces or set it exactly what you want in terms of the ideal angulation. And then we'll add in the overcorrection for additional force uh, usually it's about half a millimeter past the ideal is what we're adding in. Uh, and same thing with space closing. We'll add in that anti-tipping, the gable bend, as well as adding torque so that you don't get too much torque loss uh, with the space closure as well. Uh, the next step would be individual tooth assessment. This is also, again, all of these are covered by IFS. Uh, there's five different overcorrections that we're looking at with IFS. Um, first one we'll look at is just increasing the root tip 
for uh, for the force. This is very similar to aligners. I would say with aligners, when you see you need an additional tipping movement, uh, I know a lot of people add somewhere between five and 10 degrees to add additional tip. Same thing with torque. You're trying to add torque for upper two to two with aligners. I know very commonly I see people say they just double the amount that you're adding. So we're doing almost identical here where it's like there's certain movements that we know uh, the smart wires just need a little bit extra force to express the movement. So we'll assess, especially this is again where it helps to have records. We see if you have a pano submitted um, and we can see um, what the goals are, we can definitely go in and add in additional force for root torque or for tip. But again, it's important to place it ideally where you want it. So, you know, if you have retroclined upper two to two, but you leave it like that, then we're not going to add IFS because our assumption is you want to actually accept that type. But if you are adding a lot of torque into your upper two to two, then we know, okay, you're trying to achieve that and you, you place it where you want ideally. So we're going to add some overcorrection to try to help you get to the idea. So again, with IFS, we're always, the goal of IFS is always to help you reach whatever you approved. But we won't be changing anything. Again, the, the only the overcorrection is just to reach, again, what you're trying to achieve and what you approved. Uh, the next one that we talk about is one um, that I talked about kind of a bit, a bit in the finishing webinar, if you guys attended, if, if you happen to attend that one, where we know that when you add torque into this small design, it sometimes will cause a vertical side effect. So in this case here, where you have the left image, which is the DE malocclusion scan, what you submitted. DE small design, you can see everything looks nice and level uh, between the upper, low upper ones. However, what you can't see in this image is that some labial root torque was applied. And so we know that when, when you add a labial root torque, that actually causes an intrusive side effect. So when you add palatal root torque, it causes an extrusive side effect. So if I was to review this case, I would know exactly what's going to happen. And what it exactly what I expected to happen happened. You had an, up, an intrusive side effect on the upper left one caused a step to occur. So what why this is happening is based on how the brackets move. The wires are designed based on where the brackets end up. So when you add a torquing movement, it actually changes the position vertically. And uh, not all movements always express in the right order. So sometimes uh, before torque expresses, you get a vertical side effect, and that actually becomes the primary movement instead of what you actually wanted to happen. So in the left image, when you do palatal root torque, when you go from the tooth to the blue image, you see the bracket actually drops. It actually extrudes. And so what that does is it creates a step-down bend for the upper incisor and causes an extrusive. So I, know, I always know palatal root torque, lingual root torque causes extrusive side effects uh, with the smart wires. And labial root torque, on the other hand, causes an intrusive side effect. You see on the right-hand image, the green tooth, the bracket actually comes up. It actually steps up, and it causes an intrusive side effect. So it's easier to see here. And I, I always tell people when you're doing your detailing, you should really be looking at the brackets, how they're moving, because that essentially shows you your wire bending. It's really not much different than doing a straight wire, placing a straight wire against your brackets traditionally and seeing where the deflections are. So here, you see between the left image and the right image for the, the wire, it has a, a deflection where the upper left one is stepped up because of that fork side effect. So, um, there's different ways you can deal with this. I'd say the first way that I, I teach with finishing is in many cases, the torque discrepancy wasn't a big deal. Patients didn't even notice it. Patients doesn't have a concern of theirs. So first thing I usually tell people is accept it, if you can accept it. Uh, if you can't accept it, then a lot of times actually the in and out movements will, uh, if you do an in and out movement or a rotation, that actually also will get you to the point where it's acceptable. So for example, in this case here, the upper left two is, uh, labially displaced. This actually has excessive uh, labial crown torque. You could either add lingual crown torque, which causes that vertical side effect, then I have to add vertical overcorrection in, or you can just do a step and bend. When you do a step and bend, again, you're you're pushing from you know uh, uh, the incisal to the center of resistance. It's actually going to cause a, a torquing movement. So you actually get the same lingual crown torque effect without having a vertical side effect from the way that our smart wires are designed. So usually, again, I either tell people accept or step in or step out when it comes to torque, particularly when you're detailing. Now, if you do want, really want to express that torque, though, then you have to add an overcorrection. So in this case here, I already know, I can, I can look at the case and, be, and our algorithm will, will detect this as well, that upper left one is going to cause an intrusive side effect. 
So very simply, all you have to do is you add extrusion past the ideal into your small design. So here I would just extrude that upper left one, you know, about 0 0.3, 0 0.5 millimeters uh, to counteract the exact intrusion that, that occurred. So that's something that IFS is measuring and then adding back in for you to reduce that side effect. Now, even though we're doing that for you, I still tell people it's better, it's more predictable to avoid the side effect than for you to have the side effect happen, have IFS add in the overcorrection to prevent it. Because that's, again, you're, we are estimating the effect of the, over, the side effect, adding an overcorrection to counteract that. There's a little bit more variable there. There's variables there that you're, you know, we're going to mitigate the side effect, but sometimes we'll get it spot on. Sometimes we'll add a little bit too much. Sometimes we'll add a bit, it will add a little bit too little. Whereas if you just avoid the side effect completely, you don't have any side effects. So that always is a much more predictable way of doing it. However, if you happen to have the side effect that's going to occur, we will try to counteract that for you with IFS. The next one is the upper central incisor rotation tip side effect. This is probably the main reason why we started IFS project in general. You know, we know uh, this has been one of the, the ones that we've known for quite a while with Embrace and is one of the things that we always would add in for providers. So if you look at the top right phrase, Embrace overcorrection of mesial root tip is applied on upper right one to counteract tipping rotation during alignment. Uh, we would add this in universally for everybody. And quite often, we'd have to write back the second response when someone asks us to remove it, which is remove planned movement from upper right one and brought it back to original. However, mesial roots was applied as part of our overcorrection to counteract the tipping rotation. So again, we know that this is going to happen. Um, and our recommendation always has been to leave it in. Uh, so for just for some background for uh, any provider here that does not know why we're doing that, what we do know is with upper right one in this image, when it comes mesial out, it's going to cause a distal root tip side effect. And the easiest way to think about why this is happening is if you split the tooth in half, keep in mind your relative intrusion and extrusion roles, where when you bring something labially, you're going to get relative intrusion, you bring it to lingually, you're going to get relative extrusion, and you apply that to each side of the rotation, uh, you will get a net root tip side effect as a result. And so you get to the point where after you've done this enough time, you actually memorize it, you understand it, and then you can always look at that and counteract it. Uh, so here, here's an example of one where upper ones are going to require a mesial out rotation. You know, if you look at the clinical result four months later, alignment looks great. However, if you look at the root tip, the root tip now has gotten distal root tip. Uh, so again, mesial came out it relatively intruded. Distal came in and relatively extruded. It gave you a net side effect of distal root tip. And so what you needed to have done is we needed to add a mesial root tip over correction to counteract that distal root tip we knew we were going to get. Now, it's not, an, it's not always an unfavorable thing. Sometimes it's favorable. It actually helps you out quite a bit. Like in a case like this, upper centrals require mesial out rotation. However, they're both have excessive mesial root tip. So uh, no overcorrection was applied in this case. If you were to do this case with the liners, for example, you'd have it would require a good amount of uh, a root tip over correction likely. Uh, but here within three months, it actually already resolved. Uh, and the reason why it goes so fast is the side effect, everything is favorable with each other. So rotations occur really fast with embrace. And then when that rotation resolves, it's causing a distal root tip side effect. Uh, and you can even see the upper left one needs a lot more rotation to the upper right one also needs a lot more distal root tip to the upper right one. So it actually all played out very favorably with each other. Uh, so this is where it actually works out well. So you have to kind of keep that in mind when you're figuring out your rotation tip side effect and your overcorrection. And so we created these formulas as well as these acronyms of how do you add it in. And so what we then later just did with IFS is why don't we calculate all of this for you? Also we'll calculate if any spacing is involved on the upper centrals. And so now all you have to do and what we will send you is simply the upper ones in ideal. Place the upper one completely in ideal. And then the overcorrection for the upper central size rotation tip side effect will be added afterwards for you as post approval. Now, why do I even go over this and why do I continue to teach this? Uh, the reason I continue to teach this as well as say like the torque side effect is if you just leave it up to IFS always, uh, there are times that, uh, as you said, there's favorable and unfavorable. If you can kind of recognize that, it just gives you like the next level up in your detailing. So for example, here, where you have uh, the upper one start with some excessive distal root tip, and you're kind of doing your final detailing. 
if you kind of kind of understand, oh, actually, you know, if I actually add it in distal out rotation here, mesial in, that's going to actually cause some mesial root tip. That's going to be favorable to correct my root tip. And so instead, some people might say, okay, now I'm going to do as minimal movement. So I teach less is more, but some in this case here, if you left, say, the upper centrals in that that rotation, you didn't you didn't derotate them, then you're not actually taking advantage of the fact that you can use the side effect to your advantage. So th this is where I would say, like, it is important still to understand it because you can improve your detailing process. But it, it, as, at least at the end of the day, we'll always add an uh, IFS for you if needed. Uh, here's an example of the opposite, where you know your upper centrals look good, uh, rotations look good, uh, like alignment looks pretty good on the, if you look at the left hand images. However, the small design tech or the the orthodontist in this case added rotation to the upper centrals. So now you're actually introducing an a side effect here. And so it's like the torque vertical as a thing, it's better to avoid the side effect if you can uh, when it's an unfavorable side effect. So in this case, it's going to be unfavorable. It's going to cause root tip on your upper centrals. And it would have been more predictable to avoid the side effect altogether. However, if you did leave this, we will add an IFS over correction to counteract it. But it's still, you know, it's an estimate with the algorithm. We're going to, um, you know, every person, patient, their teeth respond a little bit differently. So while we'll be able to use our data analysis and the, the big data that we do have, you know, it's still an estimate to counteract an estimated side effect. So it's better to, again, to avoid if you possible. Uh, the last two are power chain. So with universal virtual power chain, as I said, you can actually toggle this one off. There are some providers that do not like virtual power chain. So that's why we gave that option to toggle it off if needed. Now, the reason we do this is to ensure that we get proper clinical context in the end of treatment. We, we have seen patients, cases where the, the context is a little bit light. A lot of this comes back to segmentation error. When we cut the teeth out of the tooth print, if there's any error in there, then we need to account for that by adding virtual power chain. It's very common in digital orthodontics, and you know it, it's very common in the aligner world. Uh, so where this is one of the other reasons why we implemented IFS. But we did have a lot of providers that were confused about why we had a lot of arch constriction. Uh, and it has to do, again, the virtual power chain. So now you will not see this. Before, you would see virtual shortening of the arches. With IFS, if you opt in, this will go away. So now, now the uh, there's no, uh, this will all be done again after and post approval. Uh, the last one we will talk about is additional virtual power chain. So this was pretty important because a lot of providers would talk to us in DE and mention how they would get spaces forming uh, in digital enhancement. And it has to do, again, with the inner bracket distance. So there's two reasons we generally will add additional virtual power chain. First is to close any residual spaces. This is where Dr. Hom was mentioning. It's very important to let us know if there's any spaces present. If we know there's a space present, we'll add a little bit of an extra additional virtual power chain, usually about 0.3 millimeters, just to increase that closing loop effect of the IP loop. Um, uh, and that will make it much more predictable that your spaces will close and that, that fine in your, when you're doing your finishing. Um, the other reason, is, as I was mentioning, sometimes you would get spaces forming in DE, uh, and it's because of that increase in inner bracket distance, where it acts almost like an open coil spring. Um, and so we measure every single inner bracket. The algorithm will measure every single inner bracket distance. We measure that, and then we'll add in additional virtual power chain to ensure that, or at least reduce the chance of a, of a space opening up. So same thing here. You'll see a very large space is opening up when you do large molar rotations. As the bracket really swings apart with rotations, then you have to add in overcorrection uh, to counteract that space from forming. And I've shown many cases of this in the past in my past webinars of this happening, and then how we counteract that with additional virtual power chain. And now for, again, for providers that have opted into IFS, this would be done automatically for you. So you don't need to worry about this. So I, I've taught a lot of providers to do this. We would see it a lot in their cases of them adding additional virtual power chain in multiple areas. You do not need to do that anymore if you're in IFS. We will do that for you. Um, so with the step five individual tooth assessments, the directions that I give providers of what to consider for increased force for root tip of torque, just set it to ideal. Well, um, as long as whatever you have is what you consider ideal, we will add the force if it's needed or, or not. Um, for the torque vertical side effect, so you know if you have any individual torques added in and that's going to cause the vertical side effect, um, my recommendation, again, when possible, remove the torque when you don't need it. Do in and out movements if possible instead. Um, 
if you do need the torque or you do want to leave the torque in, just place the vertical in ideal. We will adjust the vertical as needed to try to counteract that vertical side effect for you, or at least reduce the effects of it. With the upper central and sides rotation tip set effect, again, generally place the upper ones in ideal angulation for the tip. However, for the rotations, just keep in mind, like there are times where you might want to do a rotation in your finishing that will help with the detailing of the tip. There are times where you want to really make sure to avoid the uh, avoid it. However, no matter what, we will always double check the amount of rotations you placed in and we'll add in overcorrection as needed for that. For universal virtual power chain, nothing is needed. Um, as long as you're opted in, we add that as a default for every case. And for additional virtual power chain, the one thing that is very helpful for us is if you, again, you notate where there's light contacts or residual faces, and we'll make sure to add additional virtual power chain in those slots. If you don't, if you don't notate those, then we don't know that there's a space there. So we won't add anything in there. We'll only add in to the areas that have increased inner bracket distance. The last thing that we do is we'll look at um, the uh, bracket position in digital enhancement. So bracket position is also covered by IFS. We uh, One of the things I've realized is how important bracket position is. And so we talk about that a lot, even like the stage one, first goal of stage one is to get the bracket to the right spot in the plan bracket position. Uh, however, we do notice a lot of cases where they're not in the plan bracket position, they weren't repositioned uh, where we recommended them to be repositioned to. So usually I teach these slides where if there's any bracket that's significantly off center, that's gonna be difficult to finish the alignment. So say in this case, lower right three on the bottom left one, we know with lower right three, that's gonna um, be difficult to finish the alignment. Uh, whenever you have a bracket more distal, it's good at expressing more distal in rotation. If I was to move this bracket more mesial for that lower right three, it's gonna express the mesial in rotation better. Uh, so it's better to again to be in the center of the tooth, but that's our general recommendation. Same thing with the lower left one bracket on the right side image. Lower left one bracket is much more mesial. If you were to move it more distal, that will help express more distal in rotation. So we've gotten a lot of pushback on this concept. We've had a lot of providers tell me, you know, you're creating a custom wire, make the wire to where it's gonna, uh, to uh, the wire should account for it. And I, I say kind of like, yes and no. Uh, it's kind of like putting a traditional bracket way off to the meser, way off to the distal. You can add a detail bend to get the alignment correct, but you probably have to add some overcorrection because it's not where the bracket, it's not in the center of rotation. So. Like this example here, lower left two bracket, very distally placed, created a wire for it. You can see the rotation improves quite a bit. Uh, however, what we find is it kind of tapers out that expression. And so you generally will need some overcorrection to the rotation to get it to ideal, or you need to reposition the bracket. So um, if we find that the bracket is very off-centered, we'll just recommend the repo for you. So. You can recommend or request for it yourself. If you request for a reposition bracket, again, we'll totally always respect that. Uh, if you don't, we are evaluating, is that rotation you're gonna express properly? And if we think that it's not going to, if it's very far off centered and it's also gonna collide into the other tooth or bracket, then we'll we'll request for a repo. You will see that you will probably get a single tooth into a bonding jig uh, and that will come in your digital enhancement kit. Uh, the other thing that sometimes we will do is sometimes we'll just add over correction. So we are, this is where we have, again, orthodontist gauging and the IFS algorithm also kind of gauges which one should we go with. Sometimes we'll request for the bracket to be repoed. When it's not as severe, then sometimes we'll just add in overcorrection. So a case like this, we'll um, just add like usually about three to five degrees of rotation overcorrection for this upper left three, because the upper left three bracket is very distal, a little bit too distally positioned. So it doesn't express that mesial end that well. But if we added three to five degrees of rotation over correction, then, then it usually will get you there. Okay, so again, just as a reminder, step one, two, and three, general orthodontic over corrections, vertical AP transverse, that is the responsibility of the provider in our current release. And um, the step four and five is what we're currently covering with IFS, which is, um, again, anything with arch length discrepancy and individual tooth assessment. So as a general summary, our Inbrace Intelligent Force System IFS overcorrection algorithm. We have developed this after very extensive testing with our uh, different teams, our engineer, our, you know, again, I want to call out our engineering software R&D teams, as well as the rest of the clinical team that I work with on this. It's been a huge project, but we're at a place where we're, you know, we're very confident that it's going to always improve the predictability of tooth movement and reduce negative side effects. We're not saying it's going to be 
you're going to get to a perfect result at the end of every single wire. But we will say that it's going to definitely improve the predictability of movement and reduce the side effects that you may have been seeing so far in your cases pre-IFS. And again, you're responsible right now for vertical AP transverse. Everything else, you just essentially have to place it in an ideal, and then we'll take care of it for you. As Dr. Tara mentioned, this webinar is going to be presented again uh, on Thursday uh, at 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 p.m. Eastern time. And then now we can open up for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Lee, Dr. Hom. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to send them in the chat. Right now we're in the Q&A session. We did get one that came in during the conversation. So um, I'll use that question first and I'll monitor if there's any more that are coming in. But the question was, if we add or if the provider adds in any of the overcorrections or any amounts, will that be taken into consideration when it reaches IFS? Or is that a blanket amount added on regardless? Uh, so it just depends. So if you ask for a certain overcorrection, we always will respect that. So whatever a provider asks for, we always try to give. So if you ask for, say, five degrees of uh, mesial roots of overcorrection for whatever, then we will add exactly what you asked for. If you just say, I want overcorrection for this, say, I want overcorrection for the upper central incisor rotation tip side effect, then we'll, we'll definitely give it to you. But then you left it open-ended for how much you want it. So then we'll add in based on our algorithm. Perfect. Yeah, Dr. Lee, can I ask a question related to that? You know, we see cases where, uh, let's say the upper uh, two to two are retroclined, okay? So is the doctor better just putting them in ideal and then letting IFS handle it? Because I've seen a number of cases where they're going, give me you know, 20 degrees of extra torque. So they're trying to do the IFS in essence. What would you recommend? That they just put it to ideal? Um, generally, I would say just go to ideal. So it's totally fine. Again, if you want to add your own overcorrection in, we'll always respect when you have already added. Uh, it does become a little confusing for us, though, because we don't know if what you have added in is your ideal. or And then we may add even more overcorrection on top of that. Um, or if uh, So that's why it's good sometimes when you specify, I'm adding this in as overcorrection. Then we know, OK, we're going to respect that overcorrection. If you just add it in 20 degrees, then from our perspective, that has become your ideal, and we're going to try to achieve that ideal for you. Okay. That's a good point, Dr. Hom. Um, we did have another question that came in. In terms of the universal power chain, have we ever seen it cause the lower anterior incisors to slip past each other? And if so, what do we recommend in the cases that we've studied? Okay, so we haven't seen that when the small design is set up properly. So what I mean by that is we have had many providers make that comment to us. And when I look back into their cases, there's usually a few different reasons why it happens. One is their bracket position a lot of times wasn't positioned predictably. So if you had it, say, up to direct bond a bracket, that now inherently is going to cause some uh, differences in how it's planned. Um, or uh, so, or the, the setup itself actually was not properly aligned. So sometimes I'll look in and be like, well, it actually matches almost exactly how you approve the case. You might not. You just might not have been as detail oriented on the approval uh, and making the adjustments. Uh, when we again, we we've done hundreds of thousands of our own cases in, in studio, as well as with the different practices like Dr. Tong's clinic, who's the main inventor. Um, we've never seen it in any of our own cases where it's flipped past uh, each other. Now, where we have seen it is when you add a crazy amount of additional virtual power chain. We have seen providers that I've taught the concept of additional virtual power chain to that they take it to a, uh, a much past what I what my recommendation is. So say if you added like a, in your lower incisors, like we recommend, we do 0.2 millimeters as your universal. We've seen providers add like a millimeter of additional virtual power chain where the brackets in your small design now are like touching each other. Um, that is something we don't recommend doing. And we've seen cases, the teeth slip on each other in those scenarios. But with IFS, we'd never get to that point. Uh, and then with the universal virtual power chain, because again, it's only, 0.2 millimeters. Uh, it's so minimal. We've never seen it. We've never seen that actually slip um, past each other. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lee. With that, we are at time and I want to be respectful of everybody's evenings as well and appreciate everyone for hopping on to this webinar series. Thank you to Dr. Lee, Dr. Hom for your discussion in leading this webinar series today.